Good morning to those of you on our online location. Paulden, that is you. You are looking good. You didn't know, but we can see you today. So welcome to you. And Baghdad, welcome to you. We're so excited that you were here last week in person for Easter. Um, we trust that you are doing well today. And thanks for being along with us, part of the family and our online family, wherever you happen to be, which I found out this week that there's a gentleman who is a fighter pilot in South Korea who is a part of our Heights online family, and he just sent a note saying how much he's there. So yeah, we can give it up for Carter. <laughs> Carter, we love you. I um, hope you are having a good time in the other part of the world where it's totally different time scale. So uh, welcome to you, Prescott. We're glad you're here. And uh, one of the things that we value is we get to journey together that we get to do life together and we get to be in community. You'll hear us say often, this is great, this is great, but don't stop at this, okay? So this, this might be where you're at today and that's okay, but just know we're gonna keep nudging you towards getting in community where you're in smaller circles and where your heart can be known and you can hear other people's hearts and we can walk life together. Uh, one of the ways that we do that, I wanna celebrate um, is through um, people that we've defined as epic, any epic people in the room? Anybody a part of that? Yes, there you are. Let's celebrate. Let's go. And, and so if you don't know what epic is, it's experienced people in community. And so it's people with experience of life. They've experienced, I wouldn't say a lot of life. They've experienced some life. And, and yet they're at a point in life where um, time may be opened up for them, that they have other options of how to step in community and when. And so um, one of the pastors we used to have, Bill Knotts, um, who was on staff, he, when he rolled off staff, he had this heart for, I really want to see this community develop, this, the, these people who are experienced in life, and I would love to create a space for them to find community. And so um, Bill and Jenny have been in kind of spearheading that with a team of leaders, and, and it's become this beautiful thing that continues to grow. And I just want to let you know about it, because if you're a part of that epic clan where you're like, okay, I retired, but I don't want to stop there, like I want more, there's more for me, then... Um, there's things going on all, all the time. Like every Monday, there's, there's a gathering that's more like a study type gathering. And then there's luncheons that are happening and there's activities that are happening. So if that's you, you can go online and find more information out about that. Now, there's something unique about Bill, okay? So anybody grow up with or has watched the Andy Griffith show? Anybody? Okay, this is for you. Anybody else that you're like, I don't know what that is. You got two minutes to do whatever, okay? But no, the, the, what's interesting is if you meet Bill and you've seen that show, you might go, hey, he looks a little bit like Don Knotts. That's because Bill is the nephew of Don Knotts. That's pretty crazy, right? And so Bill, who's a dear friend of mine, he, he started telling me this thing like, hey, I want, I want, God's like doing this thing in me. I'd love to develop this thing. And, and he's now traveled kind of um, on cruise ships and to different parts of the States kind of doing this thing called Mayberry Memories. And Bill's going to bring it to Prescott. And so... Um, on July 21st, um, 2024, um, which is this year, I believe, still, right? We're still in 2024. Um, but what you can do is he, he walks through just these Mayberry memories. It's a celebration of Don Knotts. I believe it's his 100th birthday, right? It says on screen. Um, and, and that's coming up. But it's something he does where he connects life and stories and gospel. And if you know Bill, Bill's a genius at this. And so um, if that's your jam, if, if Andy Griffiths is your jam, you're going to love it. Um, because it's all wrapped around that, and you can figure out how to get tickets for that at the Elks Theater. So that's going on. Just wanted to celebrate. We got things to celebrate because we do life together, right? We're in this together. We walk together. One of the things we do together is a collection of talks. And a collection of talks is um, where we, we just kind of zero in on a topic for a while to, to talk about as a church family. And right now, if you've been with us, we are in a collection of talks that has to do with Jesus being the center of all things. I'm just going to, like, if we can just establish one thing, because it'll build from here. If Jesus is not the center of your life, your life is going to go sideways. Guaranteed. How do I know that? Because you were designed with the intent that the creator of the world, Jesus himself, would be the one that holds your life intact. So here's what I know. If Jesus is not the center of your life, then you are putting in a whole lot of effort. You are striving really hard to hold everything together. And you were never intended to. Jesus is the one that you're supposed to hold on to and put your effort into. And out of that, he will transform you, which will transform everything else. 
And so we were looking at, if that's true of our lives, then we're looking at the Bible and going, this defines life, it defines God. Then what we're finding is that all the way through, you should be able to find Jesus at the center of all things. And this week is no different because Jesus is even the center in your hanger. Like, true story, right? When you're hangry, Jesus is still the center. Anybody get hangry in the room, by the way? Okay, we're not at the last service yet, so you should be okay for a little bit. We should be all right. But right, like, like it's a real thing. Your emotions are affected by your hunger. Even Snickers knows this, right? <laughs> you ever watch the Snickers commercial? They got one that's one of my favorites where it, it, it shows them playing pickup football and, and uh, it's an old lady running out and she just gets cleaned, right? She just gets cleaned out. And then the buddy comes over and goes, hey, you're not yourself today. Here's a Snickers, you know? And it's the idea that when you're hungry, you're not yourself. Uh, my family and I, we used to we still do take trips to California, but we used to do them pretty regimented. In the summer, we would stay at my wife's aunt's place, and it kind of grew into this thing where my kids, when they were in high school, my older kids, when they were in high school, they would take their friends along, and so now we got so many people in tow, we got two cars, and so we'd go, and inevitably, we were going to have beach days, right? So we had our favorite beach, and we had our favorite spot on that beach, and, and the goal was that we were going to get up early enough, pack the car, make the trek through the traffic, find, and then the, I mean, the traffic's one thing, finding parking's a whole nother thing if you've, you've been there, done that, right? So you find parking. Oh, it's not done yet, because then you gotta haul all your stuff from your car to your spot on the beach, which feels like a small marathon, right? And you finally get there, put your stuff down, and you're like, okay, we're exhausted, but ready to enjoy our day at the beach. So then you go through your day at the beach, and if you got little kids, God bless them, they wanna do stuff with you. Um, so you end up doing stuff with them because you love them, and, and not just by the time you're done, your day at the beach has been exhausting. You've eaten all your food, um, you've had lots of playtime, lots of sun, lots of hopefully, well, maybe not in California, you don't wanna go in the ocean because it's too cold. So, right, so, okay, come on. Like, you all act like, no, it's not. <laughs> really, really, you're gonna play me like that, right? Todd, don't give me that. Don't give me that. This, this is the reality. If you think California is warm, you've never been to the other side, right? Like you go to the other side, you're like, oh yeah, this is freezing. I'll never go in again. Um, but, but here's the thing. You get done with your day and you're exhausted. Well, then for us, we had to load up back, haul, haul everything back, load it up in cars, and then we start to drive. Well, now the traffic is even worse. What took you 30 minutes takes you an hour and a half, Right? And now, between two cars, we're trying to figure out, where does everybody want to eat? Well, everybody's exhausted, and they're hungry, and traffic makes everybody angry to begin with, right? And so now this whole conversation, you ever been so hungry, you're like, I don't know what I feel like. That's how it feels after a beach day. So we're all feeling the same way, trying to figure out where to eat. And it's not long before um, I'm saying things that I shouldn't say to my wife. I'm reacting in ways that I probably shouldn't to where I don't care as long as it's food. And then we go somewhere and I'm mad because we chose that place. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> why did we pick here? It's terrible. And so, so there, it, there's just this human emotion. And some of you are like, you can't relate. Okay, you are saints. But to the rest of the world that's normal, like, like our emotions drive us. Our emotions can make us do things, kind of like Snickers, like you're just not yourself. And the reason I know that is because once I would get food in my system, I'd end up looking at my wife and going, I'm so sorry, I don't know what that was, right? And our story today, it is similar. In Exodus chapter 16, right, the, it begins out telling us the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. Okay, so if you've been with us, we've been following the nation of Israel, right? Last week during Easter, um, kind of the pinnacle moment of this battle between gods and Pharaoh. And, and God sets his people free by, by sending a, a miracle, essentially. Like he's going to send a judgment, but it turns out to be a miracle because he saves all of the Israelites firstborns. But, but Egypt is judged and Egypt goes, Pharaoh's like, get out of here, just go. And so it's a miracle. They never thought they would be let go and they're let go. And not only that, but, but like they're throwing gold and silver at them saying, take it all. I don't want it. And so the, they come out of, of Egypt blessed, right? And then God begins to lead them by a, 
by fire and, and, and by this cloud, right? So at night it's a fire, during the day it's a cloud and, and God's out in front of them and they can physically see God in front of them and he's moving them and then they come to the Red Sea. And when they get to the Red Sea, they begin to panic, right? Like, oh, you brought us out here just to die because there's not enough graves in, in Egypt. And God performs another miracle. He parts the sea. They walk through on, get this, dry ground. Dry ground. You, you remove the water. It probably should be muddy, but it's dry. They go across on dry ground because it's a miracle that God's doing. They get to the other side. And, and you need to catch because we, we miss this sometimes in biblical context. But the Egyptians had chased them down. Now, the Egyptians, um, it talks about them having chariots and horses horses. And, and that, what that's telling you is they had the latest weapon technology. They were the greatest army on the planet. And they're chasing down these Israelites. The Israelites make it through in time. They turn around and they get to see the water close and it ends up destroying this, this army that looked like they, no one on earth could destroy. And God just judges them and destroys them. And once you know, the next thing is, is they end up walking and, and, and there's some like in the Bible, there's some like discrepancy over how you translate. And, and so it says that there were 600,000 men, right? Well, like, like fighting men that were let out. Now that word thousand can be translated as thousand, which if that's true and you add women and children, you're talking 2 million people are with the Israelites. That's a whole lot of people, right? But it could also mean clans, and if you take it as clans, it's, it's tens of thousands of people. Either way, there is a lot of people now on the other side of the river, and they are walking down this service road. And the Egyptians had created this service road for harvesting, and they're on the way down the service road. And wouldn't you know, catch the next verse, what happens? In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Sounds like somebody's hangry. Agreed? <laughs> but what's amazing is, like, if you follow the, follow the trail of our beach day, it was not this sudden moment where we were all like, oh, we're so hungry. And for them, it's not this sudden moment where all of a sudden they flipped. It's the whole community this has been building as they continue to walk in the desert and realize there's no food here. There's no way that we can sustain life. Our physical lives are in danger because we are hungry. Now, when I put it into that context and put human emotion with it, I understand why they sit here and go, what did you do to us? Did you really bring us here? To kill us, which if you're Moses, you're like, yeah, that was my plan. I just am sick of you all and I'm just going to starve you all to death. But, but they, notice what happens. They start to go, oh, when we, were in, when we were in Egypt, we had pots of meat, which was probably true. They had a lot of livestock. Meat was probably abundant. But they, they sit there. What they forgot is when they were eating the meat in Egypt, they also had chains. They were also slaves. They weren't free to do whatever they wanted. They were told when to get up, how much to produce during the day, and when to, they could eat. And so there's this glorified view of, of sitting with these pots and meat and we can eat everything we want. It's interesting, isn't it, that your needs sometimes will glorify what used to be because today you don't have? Isn't it interesting that you ever sit with somebody that, ah, oh, the good old days. And they'll tell you this story about the good old days and somebody's with them who lived those days and they're like, it was not that good, <laughs> right? As humans, we have this way of, we, we remember stuff through this glorified lens and, and, and that's what you're getting here. They're remembering something and they're going, it was so good. So why did you bring us here? They have real needs. And verse four says, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. So God's answer is this. They have a need and God goes, I am going to perform a miracle for their need. What's going to happen is this, this language of the bread of heaven. Okay, so it's so a worldview, worldview of the Israelites at this point. Heaven is up, right? Heaven is up. And so heaven covered everything on earth. 
And so what they're saying is, remember, they're nomads, right? They're, they're wanderers. And as wanderers, what, what God is saying is the bread of heaven, the bread of heaven will cover you wherever you go. That need that you have will be covered because you are under heaven. And so bread from heaven, right? This, this, this thing that's going to sustain your physical life is going to fall and be in front of you and you're going to go and you're going to collect it. So in verse 11, then it says, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard them grum- I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight, you will eat meat. And in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. I am the Lord. What is, what is God doing? God is taking them through something. He says, I'm going to test you. You ever, you ever thought that your need in your life today might actually be a test from God to see if you'll obey him or not? Hey, you ever wondered if what, what you've got in your life that you go, God, I just need this. You need to provide this. That actually what God is doing is going, will you still be faithful and obedient inside of your need? Because for them... God's going to provide, but it's going to require that they continue in obedience to do what he said. It's going to rain and they're going to go out and they're going to collect, right? This bread from heaven. You ever, you ever th- read stuff and you go, how many quail? If, they brought, if God brought quail every night, how many quail did that take? You talk about miracles, right? God's going, God's in the midst of it. And he goes, in the midst of your need, I'm going to perform a miracle. But when I perform that miracle, it's going to be so you can see who I am. You see, if you claim today that God is your God, is your God then one of the titles of God is that he is your provider. You know what we're really good at as humans? Trying to provide for ourselves. Man, you, you ever talk to somebody? What is the key word in the first five minutes of meeting somebody? How are you doing? I'm so busy. I'm so worn out. I'm so tired. Well, what have you been doing? Oh, I've just been running. And what's interesting is, what's interesting is, the Bible doesn't talk about us being lazy, but it does talk about us having our needs met by God and not us. And I wonder how many times we're wearing ourselves out because we're trying to meet a need that only God can. And the reason he wants to meet that need is so that you would see him as God. And so with the Israelites, that, that's the context. And so verse 13, that evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. Okay, a little later in the same chapter, it says that they were like wafers made with honey. That's frosted flakes, y'all. Right? Tony the tiger, they're great. Right? Like that, that, he had it way before us. They literally, they, 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 it says that the ground and all these frosted flakes would appear every single morning. Where did it come from? The bread from heaven. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer which is about three pounds for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too much. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Okay, so so, so context, right? Frosted flakes, go out and what? Gather. Take just as much as you what? As you need. Now, the person next to you, they may have more needs and they're collecting more than you are. And you may be collecting little. But notice what God does. He meets the needs of everybody. Right? That that you may have more going on and you may have a greater need and you may have a lesser need. But here's the beauty of God. He provides enough that it meets all of the needs of his people. That no one's need is left out. That God provides exactly what everyone needed. But, but here's what I love about this. Think about it for a second. You know how long God made it rain every, every day? Except for the seventh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you know how long? 40 
years. 40 years. And you're tired of eggs. Oh, I had eggs yesterday. 40 years of going what? Out, collecting, and bringing back. Eating, and it's gone. And the next day, you know how many days 40 years is? 14,000. 14,000 days God provided day after day after day after day what they needed so that everyone's needs were met. 14,000 days and he didn't miss a day. You know how I know? Because they would have told us. How do I know that? Because they grumbled about being hungry. 14,000 days. You think God's trying to tell us a little something about his faithfulness? about his ability to produce a miracle every single day for 14,000 days. It's unbelievable. And it tells me that if God can provide in this way for them, he can provide for you. Remember, they're wandering in the wilderness. It's a desert. It's dead. And they're wandering. And what does God do? He sees them. He knows their need. And he provides. What do, I, what do I know will be true for you? God sees you. Even if you're going, I'm not sure he does, John. I feel like I'm out in the wilderness. Well, he saw them, the most desolate place. And what does he do? He provides exactly what they need when they need it. He sustains life for them. And he, he provides what they need. Now, no, no, catch what they have to do. It's habit. It's ritual. It's rhythm. Right? That what God's building in them is this belief that God will provide what I need today. God will provide what I need today. God will provide what I need today. And every day they would go out and collect. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Verse 19, then Moses said to them, Not, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell, so Moses was angry with them. Tell me that's not human nature, right? I'm going to collect double today and get ahead. And God goes, no, I'm just meeting your need today. I'm just providing what you need today. You see, today's provision, today's provision is for today, not tomorrow. And so often we want tomorrow's provision today. But God doesn't work that way. Like we get frustrated, like, God, I want you to guarantee the next 14 years of my life. And God's going, no, I will guarantee today. I will meet you today. What's amazing is they come out of a a farming logic. They they come out of a a mindset where they, they would go. And when it comes to harvest, what do you do with harvest as a farmer? You collect it all and you store it. And God is taking them out of what is comfortable to them to prove to them that I will provide your need today and I will meet what you need today. And then he goes above and beyond and he says, each morning, everyone, verse 21, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow... It's to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So tomorrow you take it off. Don't collect, right? So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day... The Sabbath, there will not be any. What I love about this is it proves that the abundance of God provides rest. The abundance of God provides rest. That that built into the rhythm of creation is that every single week we would go, hey, I can can stop trying to get ahead. I can stop grinding. I can stop working my hustle. I can stop whatever your language is for that, right? I can let that go and I, I can take a day and I can rest. Why? Because the abundance of God will provide. Is he provider or is he not? Is he Lord or is he not? Is he God or is he not? And when you make that decision and when we we decide what what he's teaching them and training them here is that the abundance of God will provide rest in your life. 
And so this is this very, very physical story, right? And you may be sitting here going, but John, John, the series or the collection of talks, right? It's, 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 about, it's about that Jesus is the center of all things. Where's the Jesus part? I'm glad you asked. John chapter six. Context in John chapter six, Jesus has just fed the 10,000. Why 10,000? You may go, John, I remember it as 5,000. There was 5,000 men. Add the women and children, you're probably around 10,000. Right, so 10,000 people have ate physical bread from Jesus. Now, that created a little bit of a stir. And so Jesus ends up walking on water in between. And when he gets to where he's going, a crowd shows up. And Jesus looks at the crowd and he goes, hey, you're, you're only following me because I gave you physical bread. He goes, you're not actually here for me. You're here because you want more signs. You want more physical bread. And then he said, they ask him this, verse 30. So they asked him, they asked Jesus, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Okay, so, so what we've just talked about, that's what they're referencing. As it was written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. Guess what happens in the next verses? You can read it later, but in the next verses between where we are and where we're gonna read, the Jews begin to grumble because he said, I am the bread of life. And then a little further down, he says this, verse 47, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the bread in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What is the connection that the very physical story we just read, where the Israelites are in the wilderness and God provides frosted flakes, that very physical story is a picture of a, a spiritual reality we live in, in the person of Jesus. That just like they are hungry and they are going to starve to death and their life is going to end, he provides physically for them. The same applies for us who are spiritually hungry. That what he says is, I am, I am the bread from heaven. Guess what the Bible calls us? We are wanderers and strangers on this earth. This is not our home. That tells us we're nomads. We don't have a home here, right? Our home is with him. And so this idea that as we wander this earth, we're nomads. And what does he say about the bread of heaven? It is Jesus who came down. Jesus is the bread of heaven. What it's saying is that anywhere under the scope of you walk on this earth, your spiritual need will always be met in the person of Jesus because he is the bread of life. That there's nowhere you can go that's too far outside of the scope of the bread of life. That what Jesus brings is just like he brought for them, nourishment that kept them alive. What Jesus provides for you is nourishment for your soul that brings life. That word life is abundant, right? That word life is that it's as God intended it to be, that it's full and it's vibrant and it's joyful, that it's life to the max, to the most. And, and what I love about it is Jesus goes, I am that for you. That is who I am for you. That just like those Israelites, can you imagine walking out of your tent and going, ah, I don't feel like this. I'm done eating this. It wouldn't be long until you starved and died. There was no other provision. You realize there's no other provision for your soul other than the person of Jesus Christ. That's it. 
And I don't mean, like, 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 let me be clear. Last week, we saw people stand up in this room if you were here. And we got to celebrate life change. We got to celebrate people meeting Jesus for the first time. They discovered for the very first time that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the one that gives them life. You realize when God talks about eternal life, eternal life isn't someday, it's right now. And so the life that God provides begins right now. It doesn't begin someday. And so the life you've been given now is transformation in Jesus. And here's what I want you to see. So often we read this and we go, oh, that's about, that's about someday, right? That's about, I accept Jesus now and he gives me life there. No, 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 Jesus gives you life here and now. The needs that you have, the needs that you have, the bread of life is available today to meet those needs. I mean, let me put it in different language. Where are you unsatisfied with your life? How, how do you know where I'm unsatisfied? Well, where are you working really hard to try and fill that hunger? Where, where is it spiritually in your life that it's manifesting itself physically in your life, right? And so it may be that I'm trying to collect relationships because relationships are filling something for me. Oh, I've met Jesus, but I'm lonely. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to try and fill that loneliness with a relationship that's actually toxic for me and it'll never work. But I'm just on the take. Or, or maybe it's that, that, that you are so unsatisfied with life and where you are that you're like, I just gotta work harder, make more money, and when I make more money, I'll make it to that point and then I'll be satisfied. But you, you realize what's happening here, right? When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's talking about your daily substance today. I've had this image in my mind all week, right? That studying for this, that I get up early in the morning and, and, and I just, my favorite thing is if the house is quiet and it's just, just Jesus and I, right? There's, there's nothing else. That's my favorite. It's like the special spot of the day. And you, you, I've had this image that I come out of my room and all across my living room floor is the bread of life. It's the frosted flakes. It's what Jesus has provided. And each part of it, he's like, I know what you need, so I've provided just enough to meet those needs that you have today. Not tomorrow's, we'll get to tomorrow tomorrow. And I walk out and the image I've had is this, that the flakes are there. It's my choice if I collect them and it's my choice if I choose to eat the meal that God has provided for me. But you know too often what happens is I do this. I just scroll. And then I'm like, sorry, Jesus, I didn't have time today. And then I wonder why down here my soul is hungry. I wonder why down here I'm a little not myself. All right, sorry, sorry, Jesus, I gotta go, I gotta get to work. I wonder how many times the bread of life that was provided for today has maggots tomorrow because I just didn't eat it. But the bread of life has provided for your needs today. He knows what you need and he has provided what you will need. I, it's amazing, isn't it? That what we got left, what we got left, you guys, in the most important moment before the cross where he was preparing his disciples, the ones he loves, guess what he gave them? He gave them bread. <laughs> I don't think that's a surprise. I don't think that's like a, oh, I didn't think that one through. It should have been a potato. He gave him bread. Do you think he wanted us to get something? That when you eat the bread, when you eat the bread, you should be reminded that he is the bread of life that he wants to meet your needs today, that he wants you to stop hustling and trust him, that he wants you to see him as provider today. Right, we, he gave us a habit, just like them collecting. He gave us a habit that we would take bread. You, you know what he said about the bread? It is my body, my body given for you. 
that we would come and we would get to center ourselves around what? The bread of life. I don't think it's coincidence that he broke bread and gave him bread. Well, just chapters earlier in the story, he told everybody he was the bread of life. And I think when we gather around the table, it's a reminder to us, right? It's a reminder that he is everything we will need, both for eternity and for today. So as you sit in these next moments and you reflect and you hold the bread, I would just encourage you, what needs can only he meet today? What needs does the bread of life, Jesus himself, get to fulfill in your life today because you'll trust him. So the next moments are yours and then we'll take it all together. On the night when Jesus would be betrayed and he had the meal before, with his friends. A conversation they'd had a little bit earlier, right after he said he was the bread of life, as he made some statements, that unless you're willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you got no part in this. To which a bunch of people went, that's too far and I'm out. And so as his disciples stood there, Jesus asked them, are you gonna leave too? And Peter steps up and he goes, where would we go? You have the words of life. Church, where are we going to go but to a table and to bread that reminds us that Jesus is our bread of life. And so he took bread and he told him, this is my body. This is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me. If you remember, out of abundance came rest, right? And when he took the cup, he talked about a new covenant. And what was the new covenant? A new covenant was not that you have to strive and you have to do, but that you get to rest spiritually, that you can be at peace spiritually. Why? Because out of his abundance of the cross, everything has been done. There's nothing left to do. That everything had been accomplished, so all that's left for you is to receive by grace. And so he declared with the cup, he goes, this is a covenant in in my blood, right? that this is a new covenant, that it's not like the old, that you can be satisfied fully in the person of Jesus, that you can rest from all your striving to be good enough and just attain. And you can accept grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and wholeness and restoration. And so he took the cup and he gave it to them. He said, take drink, do this in remembrance of me. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you that today, God, you meet us under heaven. You meet us and you provide for us. Thank you for the gift of life that is Jesus. God, thank you for the security and hope that we have that every single need has been provided for in Jesus. Would you give us the courage and the faith to see that in Christ alone, in Christ alone, it has been done and it is accomplished. That in Jesus alone, you know what we need right here, right now. And so Holy Spirit, in these next moments, would you stir up within us. Holy Spirit, would you stir over this place? Would you stir up wherever people happen to be across screens? 
God, would there be a holy awakening in Baghdad and Paulden in South Korea? God, would there be a, a, an awakening too that Jesus, you are all we need, that it is in Christ alone, everything is sufficient. And so as we worship you, Holy Spirit, would you speak life? Because we need it today. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for grace and mercy. And everybody said, amen.